Welcome to Stock Car Nostalgia Volume 1, which looks at the cars of the late 1960s and early 70s, racing on a variety of southern tracks, a period which was perhaps the start of the halcyon days of stock car racing. Our first race action is at Bristol in the early 1970s. During this sequence, look out for cars which include Pete Webb, number 8, Don Evans, number 37, Chick Woodruff, number 1, Rod Door, number 6, and Les Suffering, number 132. Look for Chick Woodruff as he passes a very young Mo Smith, number 51, and goes on to win at this particular race, a very popular win the Essex driver of car number one. Chick Woodruff, of course, who now promotes at Arena Essex. Mo Smith, who was forced to retire during season 89 due to an injury received whilst racing. Less suckling, regarded throughout Stocks racing history, along with Jock Lloyd, as the rare exponent of the Jaguar engine when fitted into Formula One stock cars. There'll be a chance to look at Jock Lloyd perhaps a little later on uh, during this Nostalgia Volume 1, but he of course was the only man to win the World Championship for Formula One cars with a Jaguar engine. Bristol's notorious circuit really did create problems. It was built on a slight slope and the back straight was downhill, which time after time resulted in all sorts of problems for the cars as they tried to negotiate the left-hander at the bottom of that downhill stretch. Still operating in season 89, but for Brisker Formula 1, uh, for, for Brisker Formula 2 stock cars only. Les Suckling's just gone through, number 132. There's Pete Webb, number 8. And there's Mo Smith and Chick Woodruff. go on the pace car to a nice round of applause as ever. Well, we're now at Brands Hatch, and what a move at the time that was for stock car racing. A famous international circuit, where the stock car venue was in fact on the Clareways Oval. More D-shaped than the traditional oval, but nevertheless very exciting. And there's opportunities to see those cars sliding through the link road which made up the Clareways Oval. 1973 is the year, and Dave Chisholm, having just switched from a successful career in the Formula 2s, was soon into winning ways with his Formula 1 stock car. There was gasps of astonishment when stock cars moved to Brands Hatch. When uh, the day opened and all they were there, the hoorah Henrys and what they used to perhaps more sophisticated racing, their jeers soon turned to cheers and the Formula Ones began to operate. A 
little bit of action on the top turn there. Once again, you can see that the oval was built on a hill. This is the second race from this particular sequence of Brands Hatch. And there's an intriguing duel between the man who was known as the King of Tarmac, George Ansel, 375, and a fellow called Stuart Smith. Needless to say, at the end of the day, just guess who took the checkered flag. You probably really won't have to guess for very long. It was Stuart Smith. One of the names that passed into history at Brands Hatch was at the opening meeting, which was covered by all the international press, when one Mervyn Bellow lifted his car high in the air, and the photograph featured in all the daily newspapers of his stock car hurtling high in the air. Wonder whatever did happen to Mervyn Gillen. A little bit of niggle on the downhill section there, around and then into the specially constructed link road at Brands Hatch and back up the hill again. And there's the man. Still plenty of runners, as you can see, although they're well spread. The red flag's gone out, the race is over, and there is a triumphant Stuart Smith, racing then under the number 391. Stuart Smith won seven finals at Brands Hatch, contributing to a grand total of 499 finals in a distinguished and glittering career. Let's take a look at the cars raced by Stuart over the period 65 to 86. Stuart's first was self-built in 65, his debut meeting being the Long Eat of the April 24th session, a Jaguar powered unit provided traction, and the car remained in use until August 1966. The first car was replaced by the infamous Albert Tiger Griffin short wheelbase motor. Virtually undrivable, Smith still managed to win races shooting straight from yellow top to star in the first regrading of 67. Stuart persisted with the Griffin car for 68, but in 1969 built a new, longer wheelbase car. The car was virtually invincible and was used until the end of 74, and during that time, it won the National Points Championship each year, plus two world finals. The Super Dodo was introduced in 76. This was Stuart Smith's The Showman coming out, with a powerful visual statement which went every bit as well as its predecessors. The car looked different, but was under its flamboyant exterior much the same as that built in 69. It worked, however, and continued in use until 79, receiving a change of colour to reflect the corporate image of new sponsors. This one, its replacement car, was a new lightweight machine looking like a motorised dinosaur. It weighed a lot less than most of the opposition, but the most distinctive feature was the large roof-mounted aeroplane. The Brad Trey Special was to prove a disappointment to Stuart. The innocent looking smash at Bellevue in 1980 virtually wrote the car off, destroying the roll cage and coming close to inflicting rather serious injuries. A drastic redesign saw the car return to the tracks which were totally different with a new smooth body style. It was in this revised form that Stuart used the car to win his third world title at Coventry in 1980. The same car appeared for the start of the 81 season, but with a change of number, the retired Chick Woodruff offered his number one in recognition of Stuart's tremendous achievement in the sport, and rightly so. By mid-season in 1981, Stuart introduced what was his mass construction, looking like its predecessor, but bristling with technical innovations. Again, a new sponsor. 1981 was his last year as points champion, after which he went into semi-retirement. But with a taste for world finals, taking the title 1983, 84, 
and Ben Farr. Stewart's failure through sheer bad luck to win the world final in 1986 coincided with his decision to pull down the blinds on a remarkable career which will surely never be matched. And so back we go to Brands Hatch, where again, George Anson is in the thick of things. He'll be seen spinning the B12 Jaguar of Dave Taylor, Bertie, and then catching and passing at England, number 24. We can also see John Hillam having a tough time before George takes the jacket flag. There's George climbing the hill, ran beneath the Dunlop sign, going a little bit wide there, almost getting in trouble. But still, well in with the chance of taking this one, which of course he eventually does. Dave Taylor about to come under attack, a sort of nudge there sends uh, Taylor's back end sliding and eventually slipping right across the track in the path of oncoming traffic. Ansel, of course, bursts through, taps the white top out of the way, at the top of the hill there, under the Dunlop sign again, down the hill, and well on his way to record another victory. Final burst from George, down the hill, into the link road, passes Alan England, number 24, there's John Hillam, in trouble. And there it is, all over, with George Ansell, the man sitting on the car there with the chequered flag, receiving the traditional round of applause from the spectators at Brands Hatch. Our next port of call is Cadwell Park, which really tested man and machine with the hill and a 90 degree bend at the bottom of a really steep slope. During this sequence, watch Willie Harrison number two put Pete Webb on the feet up on the bank. Other drivers to look out for are Brian Tuffin, number 155, Ron Webb, number 56, Wolf Brundle, 75, Ron Rogers, 152, and Charlie Finnegan, number 55. And yes, Charlie Finnegan, number 55, was the father, the man who currently runs that number, Bert. Bert Finnegan, number 55. Cadwell Park was a notoriously difficult circuit to drive. Built on the side of a hill, as you can see from this sequence it was. There was a steep incline and the cars disappeared on what in effect was the back straight behind a clump of trees. And very often you would have a man leading the pack into and behind that clump of trees. And when the pack emerged, it would be a different man actually leading the field. Time and time again, drivers were caught out at the bottom of this steep slope, which you can see now, into that difficult 
tight left-hander at the bottom of the hinge. Cador Park was famous in its heyday for its mixed meetings, which used to attract quite large numbers of both Formula One and Formula Two cars, and indeed large crowds. We now move to a different vantage point at Cadwell Park. Remarkably, the film captures Stuart Smith. There he is, passing Stuart Bamford 353. Who would have guessed that 20 years on they would be joint promoters at Scunthorpe? Unfortunately, age has caught up with the film here, and hence a certain amount of white and blue flare creeping in. A large field there, climbing up the hill, bumpers going in. We certainly see a lot of people at number eight. There have these shots from the past. And that looked remarkably like George Hansen, a bit of trouble a few moments ago. Another change of viewpoint here shows the cars careering down the victorious hill towards the tight corner. There is Ron Rogers, in fact, for 152, perched right up there on the bank. Mind you, he wouldn't have been on his own. Yet another change. Still at Cadwell Park, and this time over to the far side of the track. Look out for Dougie Cronshaw, 396, Ian Durham, 311, Willie Harrison, number 2, and Rod Paulding, number 36. Ron Webb, number 56, in trouble there. Willie goes through. There's Willie again. Cronshaw, number 396, just disappearing around the top of the hill. Ron Rogers. And now, where are we? None other than Brayfield. Certainly Brayfield Stadium, a far more conventional Formula One track. Keep an eye on the grandstand bend. There's an identified red top that forms a spectacular rollover there. This film, shot in 1971, 
has many familiar names on view. Johnny Goodall, 261. Brian Maynard, 226. Now, in fact, the scrutineer at what is now known as Northampton Stadium. Roger Spencer, 315, who is also the clerk of the course at Northampton in the late 80s. And once again, that famous name from the past, Les Suckling, number 132. There's Roger Spencer, 315. And a good shot of suckling in action there, number 132. Viewed from the opposite side of the track, we have a battle here between that man again, George Ansel, 375, and the man wearing the gold top at the time, Jim Esau, number 244. But look out for Tony Neal, number 100, and Ron Skinner, 316. Ansel and Esau down that back straight. Esau getting ready to line up the back end. Ansel putting on the brakes there. You saw that spurt of smoke come from the rear of the car. We've moved around to the back straight again for this race. Just savour the talent in the red top ranks. Stuart Smith, Doug Grunshaw, Tony Neal, Jim Esau, Brian Powles, Les Suckling, Willie Harrison, Dennis Irving, Pete Webb, Ron Rogers, and of course, George Ansell. The infamous Brayfield fence certainly very much in evidence and certainly a lot of barrels and those are equally infamous marker tyres that were always a feature in the 70s of racing at Brayfield Stadium. Glimpse of Don Evans and Gay Gordon Perrin there, number 266. It wouldn't do in the late 80s to refer to him as Gay Gordon.
He saw and Cronshaw very much in the action, so is Harris in number two. Ron Rogers there in one five two. Don Evans in 37, still a regular visitor at Northampton's Formula One meetings. And now a real treat in store. We are back at Brands Hatch to watch a superb race featuring Dave Chisholm, 252, George Ansel, 375, and Stuart Smith, 391. Also a chance to get our first look at the popular Luton Red Top, Tony Allen, 348. As the race progresses between the big three, just watch those tyres smoke. Sadly, the film doesn't reveal who was the eventual victor, but whatever, it was certainly a good race. Ansel streaking past on the inside of Smith there, but Smith seemingly holding him off for a while, but Ansel bursting through again. Still close as you can see, particularly between Ansel and Smith, Smith giving nothing away at all. The man responsible for taking Formula One stock car racing to Brands Hatch was the late Peter Arnold, famous broadcaster, commentator, and in stock cars, who along with his wife Frida, probably one of the best lap scorers ever to be seen on Brisker circuits, toured the country as a team, with Peter doing a remarkable amount of work to establish stock car racing and a very much bona fide form of motor racing. His journalistic tendencies helped tremendously by getting press interested, by ensuring that many of the motoring magazines at the time featured stock car racing on a regular basis. Well, there we are. That was certainly a good session of racing from Brands Hatch. Now we move on to another circuit of international repute, a large circuit, and this time it captures the distinctly rural raceway at Snetterton, where binoculars were a must. And who's still doing the winning? You really haven't got a guess. Too much have you. None other, of course, than Stuart Smith. Still racing on number 391. A strange circuit indeed was Snetterton, where certainly on one part of the circuit, if you lost the car, like there for instance, you could well end up in the middle of a field of potatoes. Certainly an interesting circuit, but probably not really one to see or get the best from Formula One stock car racing. A quick glimpse of the man with the flags occasionally, and that indeed is none other than 
the quite famous Al Henderson. So, of course, now we're tired. Now, in fact, it's Al. And it's his nephew, Brian Beat, who keeps the family tradition moving. We're back to Bristol now. Down that back straight, and it was literally down the back straight. And at the end of this little melee, and at the end of this particular race, it's George Ansell definitely stamping his authority all over the tarmac race race is why he was called the King of Tarmac. And so there, making his bid past the commentary box on the home straight, round turns one and two, and then down the back straight. A good shot of him there. Ron Webb is the man that he's just passed on that turn by pushing him wide. And after that victory by George Ansell, we remain at Bristol. Our second race, in fact, sees a good deal of fence crunching in the early laps. And eventually it's Tony Allen, 3.48, who moves into the lead position. However, the camera charts the race progress of Pete Webb, number eight, there's Mitchell, 238. He appears for the first time in our film of nostalgia. And we also get, if you watch carefully, a quick glimpse of Darky Wright, number seven. To call this track Bristol is rather a misnomer, because in fact it's about 14 miles from the centre of Bristol, parked right up on the top of the Mendip Hills. It was an originally a karting track known as the Mendip Raceway, a mission very difficult to obtain to make any major alterations to the venue. It is in fact right in the middle of a designated beauty spot, looking right out over the Cheddar Gorge. And very often, the whole of the stadium can be shrouded in fog or cloud, whilst just half a mile down the road, everyone and everything is bathed in brilliant sunshine. Certainly during the period that we're looking at now, it's a very popular venue for the Formula One stock cars, and still is, in 1989, for Formula Twos. Bank holiday meetings in particular, from that particular catchment area, attracting huge crowds. There's Les Mitchell, 238. Les Suckling just behind him in 132.
Right, I've kind of parked up on the centre green there, which really isn't surprising. And there's Darkie Wright, number seven. In 1975 was the year of the split when a number of southern based drivers broke away from Brisker and raced at alternative venues. This next footage shows a number of former Brisker stalwarts including Pete Genshaw number 258, Pete Webb number 8 and Alan England number 24 racing at Swindon. And indeed ironically enough Swindon returned last year under the Jerry Domit banner but only for Brisker Formula 2 stock car racing. Certainly in the 70s, it was a very popular venue for both Formula 1 and Formula 2 stock car racing, with racing taking place on Wednesday nights and on Saturday nights, with mixed meetings being a particularly big attraction at this venue. This second sequence was shot uh, as the light was fading. So please, don't adjust your sets. The eventual race winner was the driver of car number 111, Roy Wilson. Down goes the checker flag. There is Roy Wilson wearing a white roof. And there he is on the car. Our film ends now where he began, at Bristol. We're going to see a good race between Les Mitchell, 238, and Tony Allen, 348, with good old Johnny Goodall still racing today, number 261 then also getting stuck in. Johnny Goodall, of course, having a long history and career in stock car racing, probably driven under more numbers during that time than any other driver, and currently racing with the number five. And Les Mitchell, 238, it all on the outside there. One twenty one featured just for a moment there, which memory says like was in sound. Tony Allen in 348, Les Mitchell in 238. It looks tight. Mitchell drawing away on that uphill section. So there's Danny Allen winning that place. We hope that you've enjoyed this tape.